Our first speaker is going to be Yehel Corlander. Uh, Yehel is a PhD candidate in the Sociology and Anthropology Department at the University of Haifa. Uh, she's also a lecturer at uh, Tel Chai Academic College. Uh, Yehel is writing her dissertation on agricultural labor migration in Israel. She was involved in research and in writing uh, fascinating reports about the Israel-Thai bilateral agreement and its effects on Thai migrant workers and the agribusiness in Israel. She's also a research team member uh, and next year will be a postdoc in the Traf Lab Research Project. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you, Professor Gordon. It was inspiring. And wow. <laughs> so I read the article <laughs> and I have some comments and ideas because really what I want is to, to take all my uh, papers and put them in the trash and just listen to radar now. <laughs> but actually, what? I need to look. Still, I will um, stick to the papers. So, Professor Gordon invites us to think of structural interventions which can regulate the human supply chain. In the Israeli context, we were facing an opportunity to investigate state's intervention in real time. In this talk, I would like to examine the Israeli attempt to regulate the agricultural labor migration. More specifically, I will examine the role of the IOM in the bilateral agreement by applying Professor Gordon's theoretical framework and extend it to a further impl implications. <laughs> in an article regulating the human supply chain, Professor Gordon provides us a structural perspective to the problem resulting from the unregulated world market of human labor. As Gordon noted, notes, the contract labor migrants turning into a captive labor market, labor force, is structural, meaning it is a product of the global labor market under current economic conditions, laws, and enforcement levels. As she explained, one of the main problems is that the recruitment industry employ multiply levels of subcontracting activities. These activities act outside of territorial reach of the states. Therefore, as Gordon writes, quote, labor recruitment has earned a reputation as not only ungoverned, but ungovernable, unquote. I would like to extend this thought and to place it in a framework of neoliberal configuration of migration management. While the recruitment industry uh, to be, can be identified in various time in the history of migration in a variety of economic configuration of countries, the prosperity of it can always be attributed to the institutional logic of the neoliberal state. Because of the neoliberal configuration of outsourcing and privatization, more and more countries are taking an active role in the establishment and regulation of large parts of the migration industry. There are many reasons for the neoliberal states to do that. But the main one, as has already been said by Israeli scholars, who actually, you are sitting here, <laughs> most of those <laughs> scholars, uh, are deresponsibilization. This deresponsibilization is of states' agents for labor migrants' rights and conditions. By doing so, the neoliberal states perform governing from a distance. Going to the Israeli case, using outsourcing, as a way to govern from a distance has been used by the states of Israel through private recruitment companies. In doing so, Israel has established a private recruitment industry, which was motivated and thrived on collecting excessive recruitment fees. Israel has earned government without responsibility and turned a blind eye on the collecting of the excessive fees. This blind eye is easy to turn since, as, since, as Gordon said, one of the main problems is that the recruitment industry acts outside of the territorial reach of the states. If we look at that from the perspective of the recruitment industry, this is their main source of strength. Recru recruiters is sending in sending countries simply cannot work without the help of this and the assistance of recruiters in the destination country. Each of the recruitment companies work mostly within its local legislation but maintaining a connection with others in a global space, which is legally obscure. Going back to Gordon, this is the structural problem which requires a structural solution. 
Israel's blind eye did not go unnoticed. The various forms of exploitation, and especially the collecting of the excessive recruitment fees, became a subject of criticism by local human rights uh, NGOs, the state controller, and other officials' players. So what happened when the neoliberal logic and configuration of de-responsabilization meets pressure of the human rights regime? More specifically, in the Israeli case, how come all Thai recruitment companies were shut down? How were recruitment fees reduced by slightly more than two-thirds? For many years, the states of Israel refrained from signing bilateral agreement with migrant countries of origin in order to avoid taking any responsibility over the labor migrants. The transition from a policy of refraining to a policy that stands for the exact opposite, namely an official and declared policy of signing and implementing such bilateral agreement, is a fundamental change in Israeli policy. I would like to argue that the IOM, alongside other factors, plays a significant role in this, cha in this change in policy. Did I say the IOM is International Organization of Migration? No? Yeah, okay, so it is. <laughs> <laughs> in July 2005, the Israeli government announced a different recruitment method due to the government resolution. Section 6 of the decision officially recognized the exploitation of labor migrants and the will of the states of Israel to fight it. The decision does not mention any possibility of signing a bilateral agreement with the country of origin. It mentioned only the IOM, or, I quote, another arrangement to establish for this purpose. The subtext of this decision was that the behind the scene, Israel will promote an agreement between the Thai government and the IOM, not directly to Thailand. At that time, the role which was intended, intended for the IOM was to replace the private recruitment companies in both countries. In 2007, the Thai government signed an agreement with the IOM which was accompanied by a letter from Israel discovering their part in the matter. Why to use the IOM? Why not simply incriminate a bad recruiter? First, as Gordon said, even if the worst actor were eliminated, most transnational migrants would still be paying amounts of money. The use of the IOM results from the full understanding of the structural problem by the states of Israel, to my opinion. The only chance to fight excessive recruitment fees is to eliminate the global spare of action of the recruitment companies, which act in the two countries, between the two countries, which means to disconnect the bond. The use of the IOM in Israel, in Israel and Thailand bilateral agreement is a structural solution for the structural problem. However, it is more than that. The IOM, we need to know, presents itself under the discourse of international uh, migration management and international human rights regime. The main criticism directed to the IOM in this context was that o the organization lacked mandate to act on humanitarian issues. Moreover, moreover in the early 2000s, human rights organizations condemned the IOM for a human rights violation, and activists claimed that the organization was the voice of the state's interest and not of the migrants and the refugees. In this context, we should note that in 2010, 96% of the organization budget comes from countries or interstate organization. On the theoretical level, it is argued that the involvement of the IOM and the expert discourse it led turned political issues of social struggle into technical issues of migration management. I argue that the use of the IOM come as, a, as an Israeli creative solution. Can you think of Israel thinking of creative solution? So this is what I think. A way out. <laughs> a way out of internal trapping, a compromise between two contradictory states' logics, one that had to be in line with international human rights standards, and one that wishes to avoid the responsibility resulting from enforcing it. The IOM is the perfect candidate for this purpose, like the two faces Janos, for truly the benefit of migrants, but still within states' interests. Let me illustrate this point. An Israeli senior official who I'm interviewed said, and I quote, we said it was both a moral and a practic practical concern. There's no direct negotiation with the Thais. It was if to square the circle around the square, unquote. From the IOM perspective, things appeared a little different. 
One of the IOM senior officials told me about that, and I quote, in the beginning it wasn't even a triangle. It was just the Israeli goes, this is what we decided, and the IOM will do it. <laughs> <laughs> that sounds familiar, isn't it? <laughs> uh, and that was like, whoa, we can't. You have to talk. Your government, their government, you have to talk. Actually, we told them, I continue the quote, yes? Actually, we told them, you need to have a bilateral agreement with the Thai government that has a state-to-state -state structure, and then we will be able to work within it. But at the time, Israel had the policy of there is no bilateral agreement on that issue, and that changed, unquote. And this is how everything played out. The states of Israel paid the IOM to establish a branch in Israel and to set up their operation in Thailand. I'm talking about 2007, but the first one. Meetings were held uh, with the relevant members in Israel and in Thailand. Private recruitment agencies were strongly opposed and put a lot of pressure to cancel the new agreement. And in 2009, like most of the people here know, the agreement between the IOM and Thailand were not implemented and expired. It was clear that the, IO, that the IOM will not open a branch in Israel. In 2010, a new agreement was signed. Now it was a bilateral one, G2G, Israel and Thailand. The IOM now was meant to replace the recruitment companies in Thailand only. Another NGO was recruited to be working in Israel side, SIMI, the Center of International Migration and Integration. Wait with SIMI, one moment, but first, how and why did the Thai government agree to an international organization that represents the interests of the states of Israel to work on the land of Thailand? It's a sociological question. Uh, an owner of a Thai recruiting company said to me, and I quote, you know, the IOM was not at all a Thai idea. For the Thais, it was a shame of the national honor, as if we cannot control our own companies. And in Thailand, they kept postponing the implementation for any agreement, because no way will the IOM tell the Thai labor office what to do. So Thailand said to Israel, and I quote, fuck you. <laughs> but then the US placed Thailand in Thai two on the black list of human trafficking, which cornered the Thai government. And this could not be ignored anymore. End of quote, unquote. In August 2012, 19 Thai private recruitment companies received a letter from the Thai Ministry of Labor announcing that their activity was suspected, suspended due to collection of illegal fees. It was clear that they will not be resume activity since the IOM had, re had replaced them. In Israel, SIMI replaced the IOM, but not as the one responsible for the migrants, but rather as a supervisor over the Israeli companies, which were now only to handle the migrants in Israel. SIMI also collected money for themselves and for the IOM in Israel. The money comes from the Thai migrants, $450 per migrant. SIMI is the Center of International Migration and Integration, as I said, an organization that defines itself as committed to protecting the rights of migrants and asylum seekers under international standards. It is a quasi-autonomous non-governmental organization, to my opinion. It is not a governmental organization, but it does implement principles, values, and objectives of the states truly for the benefits of migrants. To summarize, the states of Israel acted from the same toolbox of criticism that was directed to it by turning to two organizations, one local and one global, who speaks the langu language of the international human rights regime but also work as state subcontractors, subcontractors following the state's interests. Don't get me wrong, the IOM and CIMI played and are playing a significant role in the process which could not have happened without them. But it is still an outsourcing as a way to govern from a distance by the states of Israel without taking full responsibility. I believe that we are on the right track about it, but the Israeli companies are still there. And as Castell and Miller wrote about the migration industry, it is self-sustained and can be so difficult to control. And what about the working condition? Reducing recruitment fees are essential and an important step, but not the only one. In the Traff Lab, I believe, we will investigate those questions and look for more structural solutions. Thank you.